स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. We are in the first module of our lectures. The first module as you know is introductory in nature. We have already been through six lectures, uh, the first two of which were devoted to an understanding of the domain of cultural studies. Uh, the ones after uh, 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 three or four after those were devoted to um, you know the way in which the findings from science may be incorporated into an understanding of ourselves as cultural beings in which the paradigm of evolution was considered as one of the best um, paradigms which can shed light on human behavior and psychology which lead to culture. In the last lecture we looked at memetics in a bit to understand cultural units. Um, in, an, in a way that is analogous to uh, biological units called genes. And today we are moving uh, into what is really the third phase in the first module, which is devoted to cultural theory. And uh, the first theory that we are going to look at is the theory of structuralism. So, as always, let us let's do a recap of what we saw in the last lecture. In the last lecture, we so, among other things that according to, uh, to scientists, according to cultural thinkers or uh, cultural studies practitioners who believe in bringing in an analogy between biology and culture, uh, the field of memetics for, you know, for them is a strong field in that it uh, you know through the analogy of the gene and, and the meme enables us to look at both cultural transmission and genetic transmission in terms of evolution. We saw that the meme is a noun which, uh, which may be defined as a unit of cultural transmission or imitation. And as examples of memes we saw that the examples were given by Richard Dawkins in his book The Selfish Gene, um, where a chapter has been devoted entirely to what he calls memetics or the study of memes. And we found that examples of memes are tunes, ideas, catchphrases, clothes, uh, fashion, technology, language and religion. And um, over and above that we also saw that as Dawkins um, showed us uh, for genes to survive for sorry for mims to survive uh, they should have these qualities of longevity fecundity and copying fidelity and uh, you know uh, only by these characteristics may mims survive as cultural units in the cultural what we may call the mimosphere then we found that uh, Dawkins very beautifully tells us that we are you know not really slaves of Mims, we are not slaves of these, you know, thought patterns that are there in our minds that are even instantiated as, as neural patterns in our brains. What saves us as a species is our unique capacity for conscious foresight and of altruism. Okay, conscious foresight allows us to, uh, you know, to for, to sort of envision a future towards which we may. Uh, work and towards which we may also change our memes and our capacity for altruism okay, of helping others whether in their pure form or in their reciprocal form. This too is a characteristic we have it may save us from being what Dawkins uh, calls in his essay uh, slavish uh, you know um, slavish imitators or slaves of genes right. So, uh, I hope uh, uh, in this brief re recap, we have been able to uh, quickly recall what we did in the last lecture. And today, we move into 
uh, this very important domain called cultural theory. Okay. Without theorizing, without a degree of abstractness, okay, we shall never be able to you know, uh, bring to bear upon different cultural forms, phenomena, etcetera, uh, certain generalized statements. Only when we know theory, okay, when, we are, when we are acquainted with and then adept at theorizing, can we throw some um, light on uh, phenomena, cultural phenomena, which otherwise will remain heterogeneous, discrete and isolated. Okay. So, first we are going to briefly, very briefly look at what cultural theory is, at what theorizing is and then move on to our first theory, which is structuralism. The key source texts in this lecture are Chris Barker's Cultural Studies, Theory and Practice and Zeman and Kaposi's Cultural Theory and Anthology. This is an edited volume, actually edited volume cultural theory and anthology. Right. So, let us begin with asking this question, which many find difficult to answer. Okay. What is theory? Theory has received, if I may say, uh, a bad name okay, in uh, from certain quarters and um, to be fair at, at least at times, their fears or criticisms may not be without any foundation. But what is um, all the more alarming is the tendency in some uh, people in academics to completely throw theory out of the scenario. Okay. If you know the uh, it um, as some some theorists have shown, it perhaps arises among other things from a fear of learning new words, from a fear of learning new technology, you know, uh, new uh, new terms, new technical terms. I have, as a person who likes theory, okay, who um, does theory, uh, I have always been surprised at this. For instance, we do not um, think twice before teaching a term like uh, photosynthesis uh, by teaching the theorization okay, of or the articulation in specific words, right? Uh, the articulation of how a plant produces its own food. Okay. Uh, we do not find it um, uh, did not find it a grandiose idea okay, or something or even something that is not required to teach a class a standard 4 or standard 5 student photosynthesis. Right? The student is expected to know it, but why uh, do some people dissuade even postgraduate level students from undertaking theory. Right? This is also in the humanities okay, akin to formulating, these are formulations. So, if you are not scared to formulate uh, you know theories to uh, formulate um, stuff about or formulate um, or write out in, in um, not if not, uh, not jargon really, but write out in a formal sort of a way okay, what uh, for instance entropy is or the second law of thermodynamics is, why can we not you know formulate or articulate things in an equally formal manner about cultural phenomena, okay, where we find that uh, or when we find that uh, uh, formulating or articulating things in a formalized way in about as far as scientific phenomena are concerned is a given. Okay. So, well let us look at this slide theory may, may be in a, at this initial stage, okay, theory may be uh, described or defined as an intellectual activity uh, whose main job, so to speak, is these three things, okay, is to interpret right, cultural data. By here, by cultural, I mean all cultural forms, maybe literary data, okay, a literary text, or maybe sociological uh, um, uh, text, or maybe a social situation or cultural practice. Right? Uh, theory, the, uh, the job of theory is threefold. 
okay, which is to interpret to make certain generalizations okay, by the use of concepts and our uh, next module is therefore, uh, devoted to key concepts in cultural studies with which we build theories. Okay. And finally, to offer a critique, theory does not mean simply writing out in difficult English or in difficult terms okay, using jargon, um, things that you can talk very simply about. Right. So, theory is therefore, a description in an intellectual activity in which you describe uh, describe things about culture and other cultural form and cultural forms in a certain manner okay it may be also called a way of speaking and you interpret all the cultural data in front of you uh, you make try and make you know abstractions generalizations about those so that you have certain theories which you can apply and you offer a critique of those cultural forms and cultural practices. So, basically this is what one does in theory. right? So, we may have other kinds of terminology in a bit to, to, to you know understand what theory is. So, the alternative terms and phrases that we may use for theory are these. Theor a theory is an organized set of ideas, a theory is also an explanatory framework theory is a position you take on any issue, a theory is a general idea, a theory is also a comprehensive explanation of something and a theory is also a proposition. Now, uh, how are you expected to go about even talking okay, about socio-cultural phenomena, right, practices and objects, if you do not have for instance uh, an organized set of ideas around which you begin to talk about something, if you do not have an explanatory framework, right, a theoretical framework. For instance, if you do not have a general idea or even for instance, when you do not have a certain position okay, to critique that. Okay. So, uh, do not be scared of theory, theory is learning theory is the most beautiful exercise and uh, you will find that it equips you not just academically, but for all so many aspects of life. Okay. So, what is theory? The alternative terms as I said theory is if you look at this slide again, organized set of ideas, it is an explanatory framework, it is a comprehensive explanation, a proposition, a general idea and a position you take on um, socio-cultural issues and practices and objects. Fine. So, um, let us read from Zeman and Kaposi's Cultural Theory and Anthology and in the introduction to this edited volume, this is what they have to say. Cultural theory constitutes a step back from an immediate engagement with culture to a place of critical reflection. This is important, okay? I have highlighted this to a place of critical reflection where insights gained and lessons learned in the study of culture are consolidated into general frameworks and organizing principles for future analysis and investigation. I think this is one of the finest ways in which you can tell a student what the business of theory is all about. Okay. Let us unpack this a bit. Theory, they say, is not an immediate unreflective okay, engagement with the forms and practices of culture in the sense that you uh, like many people okay, who are uh, like many people you just do not give very casual comments about a cultural object or form or cultural practice or generally of what culture is. Right? This is not uh, you know uh, being academic, this is not being reflective. Okay? So, A when you are doing theory, you are your responses are never immediate, okay? they are not reactions, okay? they are you are expected to have thought out reflections that are thought out. So, it is a step back from an and says as they say an immediate engagement with culture to uh, a situation or to a level so to speak okay, of critical reflection. Okay. Now, the next part is also important, where insights gained and lessons learned in the study of culture 
or look at this word consolidated into general frameworks. Okay. Look at the slide before this, we saw that theory is also an explanatory framework. Okay. So, all the lessons learned, okay. so you make observations, okay. after observation after observation you come to try and extract okay, a general statement or framework right, within which you can explain not just the cultural phenomenon that you have been studying, but which will also accommodate at least similar, okay, similar phenomena that you will come uh, across in the future that others may come across in the future. So, the you could even say the, the test of a theory is in the number of individual, okay, uh, individual um, occurrences okay, of, of phenomena that could be explained by it. Okay. So, where you know the, the lessons gained are consolidated into a general framework and organizing principles. Now, the data that you have in that sense it is not different from, from the scientific enterprise really. Okay. You have to organize that data, you are not to leave it uh, chaotic, you have to organize those data within the general framework and principles. There are some organizing principles and the important word here is for future analysis and investigation as we say that it ha has to lend itself to uh, an equally sound analysis for future events and similar uh, you know, events that you are going to observe in culture. So, cultural studies, now this is a quotation from Chris Barker in his book Cultural Studies Theory and Practice. Cultural studies is a body of theory generated by thinkers who regard the production of theoretical knowledge as a political practice. See here in fact, so important is theory to cultural practice that Barker does not hesitate to even define cultural studies as a body of theory. Okay, so, cultural studies and theory are in that sense analogous, they are even perhaps the same. So, cultural studies cannot do without theorizing. Now, now the, these are this is a body of theory that has been generated by thinkers not simply for the sake of making theoretical formulations. Okay, there is another part to it and which is to do with again let us go back to that slide to do with position. right? where he says that who regard the production of theoretical knowledge as a political practice. The theorizing therefore, becomes a political act. So, theorizing has uh, as we saw in the first two lectures that the uh, you know the uh, revealing power structures, okay. talking about power is one of the fundamental aspects or one of the fundamental jobs if you like of cultural studies. Okay. So, in that sense theorizing is not only making you know abstractions, theorizing is also you know a political act by which you you know show the structures of power as operating uh, in society. Here again continuing to read from Barker, here theory is not held to be a neutral or objective phenomenon, but a place of positionality. Remember we came across position as uh, a word that you can use for theory that is of the place from which one speaks to whom and for what purposes. Within the domain of cultural studies, there are a variety of theoretical perspectives that compete for ascendancy, the most prominent of which are Marxism, structuralism and post structuralism. And in fact, uh, owing to paucity of time here, okay, because there are other modules we have to do, there are other things that we have to look at, I uh, shall also be talking about structuralism, Marxism and post structuralism as uh, theoretical stances okay, in cultural studies. Right? Of course, feminism is a very important part, a very important theoretical framework, but I would be taken, taking it up in when I talk a bit about gender or other there, there may be two lectures devoted to gender. Okay. So, even though I may not be able to talk about different theories, um, we talk about post coloniality for instance is another theory, but these will also be spread out over uh, you know the, uh, the other lectures in other modules. Right? Fine. So, uh, having talked about theory though of course, very briefly I, I could have given a whole lecture on theory really, but um, there are other issues to be looked at. We are now going straight into this 
uh, theory known as structuralism and we shall see how you know these are again this is a theoretical framework this is a position okay this is um, uh, these are uh, these gives us propositions okay uh, in uh, you know as theoretical enterprises fine the first thing to note is structuralism is a science Okay. By science here, I do not do not mean that it is a branch of um, it is a branch of the sciences like physics is or biology is or chemistry is. Okay. It is a science or a systematic, okay. it is a systematic rational logical study of humankind. Okay. So, even in the humanities and social sciences, okay, where even though some people say that sometimes vagueness is a certain degree of vagueness is a virtue. Um, there are theories that uh, at least aim to look in a in a systematic way at um, you know uh, uh, at the, the cultural products of humankind. Okay, so structuralism we may first define it as a science of humankind. And what is? Let's look at the slide here. What is the goal of structuralism. The goal of structuralism is to discover or uncover basic structures. Remember our lecture, our I think fourth lecture if I am not mistaken on uh, evolutionary psychology. There too we had seen that the goal of evolutionary psychology okay, is to uncover the structure and the design of the human mind. Okay. Here what happens is it is also a systematic study, it is, it is a bid, it, is, uh, it has as, as its goal the uncovering of structures, but these are you know very fundamental structures which can be applied to maybe all forms of culture, even science as a form of culture, the structuralist enterprise and we shall look at this in a while. So, uh, suffice it for now to simply understand that structuralism see, seeks to uncover or to dig out so to speak okay, the basic structures of culture, the basic structures of our thinking. Now, it holds therefore, that there are deep structures okay, in us. The deep structures are those of actions, cultural arrangements, thoughts, perceptions and feelings. Okay. Now, um, Without uh, the deep structures in us, right? Um, almost as a priori in our, you know, in our, uh, in our minds. Without these deep structures, structuralism holds as a theory that we, uh, we cannot, uh, uh, you know, the human race cannot generalize. Okay, cannot, uh, cannot generalize or you know, uh, generalize or make general statements. Okay, about cultural phenomena. Everything would remain. Chaotic. Okay, so going by the deep structures of perceptions, thoughts, cultural arrangements, and feelings and actions, we try and do structural analysis of culture. Right now, uh, uh, the the structuralist the structuralist uh, school is uh, not one that is, you know. Uh, only to do with cultural studies as a discipline, as a domain, it is applied to many fields and more than what I am showing here. But for instance, it suffices for us to understand you know the scope that it is applicable to anthropology, to literature, to psychology, to mathematics, to linguistics, maybe to the computer, to the computer science, to biology and uh, uh, you know some strong proponents may claim to in fact all knowledge forms that humankind has ever produced. So, therefore, if you go back to the various terms that uh, you know or synonyms of theory, we find that structuralism is a cultural theory in that it is an explanatory framework, it is an organized set of ideas and it is also it may not be an overtly political uh, in a position, may they say that structuralism is an apolitical, it is a non political stance, but it too has a particular stance, a position which we shall see. Now, the structuralist theory holds that the mind is a structuring mechanism, okay, which follows rules to make sense of the world. 
Now, remember as I said we have deep structures in our minds without which now you know all data would have been you know uh, it would have been terribly chaotic would not have. So, how does one make sense of the in the stimuli that we keep getting all the time? How does one make sense of not just the basic stimuli, but also all the complex stimuli that uh, keeps um, you know coming to us that we we take in all the time right. So, the mind has to somehow structure uh, you know uh, to make some sense of it have to has to make some um, uh, you know has to organize you know all the data that are coming in. So, the mind therefore, structuralists say is a structure is, is, is a structuring mechanism and that mi the mind follows rules right follows rules in order to make sense of the world. A structuralist understanding of culture is concerned therefore, with the systems of relations of an underlying structure and the grammar that makes meaning possible. Now, we know that meaning the emanation of meaning the creation the encoding and decoding of meaning as we saw in uh, the first or second lecture in module 1 is uh, one of the fundamental goals of cultural studies ok at least in new or contemporary cultural studies. So, what does a structuralist approach to culture do? It is concerned with how meaning in culture is a result of a system of relations okay, among different units. So, therefore, you know uh, the inspiration really is from ling uh, the study of language given to us by uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, a Swiss linguist and uh, uh, it may also be one of uh, the limiting factors of this theory, but uh, the fact is it is it draws its inspiration. Uh, the cultural variant of structuralism draws its inspiration from the linguistic theory uh, theories of structuralism and semiotics as given by Ferdinand de Saussure. Okay. So, anyway so, uh, culture is seen as therefore, a system of relations or relations among what or relations between what, what are these units that we are talking about is what we shall see in a while. So, as I had mentioned Ferdinand de Saussure the Swiss linguist okay, is um, he, he devised the study of signs or semiology or some, some call it semiotics, which is a science of signs. Now, this is the most or we would say the sign is the fundamental unit not only of culture and language, but also of structuralism as a theory. Okay. Structuralism is as a theory begins with the basic unit known as sign, a scientific investigation. Okay. Uh, into culture, into language, into all cultural forms and tries to give some organizing principles, okay, a framework of how uh, to, to manage so to speak and uh, how to both encode and decode otherwise enormously chaotic so called um, uh, chaotic data. There is another name here which is C S Pierce and we will not be going into Pierce and we will be uh, staying more with Saussure, but he says this we think only in signs as human beings uh, therefore, signs or the its practices which are known as signifying practices. Okay. Uh, signs are what defines us or, or signs thinking in signs is as Pierce says something that characterizes okay, us as thinking beings uh, we think only in signs. So, signs um, are what is used in meaning and if you ask how are signs related to meaning, signs are used a both in the creation and interpretation of meaning and we shall when we unpack this theory we shall understand how. For the time being it is just uh, it is simply uh, you know uh, you may simply understand that the sign is the basic unit uh, not only in language culture and other forms or not only in structuralism even some of the thinkers say that it is a basic unit of the thinking process itself. And how is it that because it is through the sign the creation of the sign by us Okay, by human beings. Uh, so, much so that we are called homo significans not just homo sapiens, but homo, homo significans that we are always in a system of signification. So, signs are used in both the creation and the interpretation of meaning. It seems under this theory at least that without signs there is no thinking, without signs there is no meaning. 
Now, going by uh, the school of semiotics and structuralism, therefore, the uh, first step always is to uh, to understand uh, from a linguistic point of view that any word is a sign. Okay, a word is a sign. The word word itself is a sign. Okay, what is a sign? A sign is made up of two parts. Okay, as you see in this slide here, which is um, signifier and signified. Okay. So, in another way of putting it a sign may be split right into two parts. Um, scholars call it uh, like the two sides of a piece of paper the recto and verso sides which you cannot separate. Can you separate the recto you know the, the recto side of a piece of paper from its other side. Okay. But, at the same time you say that this paper has two sides. So, also a sign, a sign has or comprises two parts, one is the signifier and the signified. Okay. The signifier according to Saussure is the sound image and by implication by extension we can also say that it is also you know the mark on the page. Right. So, the sound image or the mark on the page and the signified that is what is you could say what is um, uh, what, what is the, the psychological impression. Okay created moment you use a signifier, okay, a sign, a signifier that is the sound image or the mark on the page, uh, what the, the psychological impression that you get that is called the signified which uh, we for which we may also use the term concept. So, therefore, every sign has two parts, uh, a sound image or a written image okay, which elicits a response which is a psychological response to us which uh, was what Saussure uh, uh, said and which others say are also the conceptual part of the sign. Okay. And this whole business, this whole process so to speak okay, of um, having a signifier and having it sort of uh, give us a psychological impression uh, which is a concept is known as if you look at this slide here is known as signification. The whole process of uh, of the sign and what it does it is two, two parts do is known as signification. Okay. Therefore, meaning, okay, meaning is a matter of two parts, meaning is a matter of the sound image which is as you know the signifier and the concept that is the signified okay. and the association right, between the sound image and the concept, the, sig the association between the signifier and the signified is what gives us the meaning. Okay. Uh, for instance, now this is a very common example used. For instance, if we have a sound image that is I say the word tree, this is a sound image or I write these letters T R E E, okay. this is uh, a written image. Okay, uh, image. These are marks on this slide, right? So, when the moment I utter the word tree and I say or I write down tree, it will create what Saussure called a psychological impression. Pardon my handwriting. A psych psychological impression in our minds, which is the concept, and then we may think of a tree okay or if you are you may think of maybe uh, you know some kind of tree structure in your in your uh, in a computer science right now uh, therefore every sound image or every signifier right every signifier would therefore has to if meaning has to happen this is important okay every signifier will have to give you a, a psychological impression called the concept there is no signification okay if a signifier has no signified in fact we can't even call it a signifier because it does not you know signify something then it they, it is not a sign okay it can never um, enter into the process of signification uh, signifier and signified and sign and signifying system or signification. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to a very important formulation within 
structuralism and this is the concept of arbitrariness. Okay. Now, we know we have a signifier and we have a signified. Okay. So, source says that the relationship between the signifier and the signified is one of arbitrariness. That is, it is an arbitrary relation in the sense that there is no one to one correspondence, okay? no one to one or one on one correspondence between a sound image and the concept. This is immensely important and I may be repeating this even in uh, you know other lectures. The say for instance, this chair that I am sitting on, okay, just consider this, I am sitting uh, on a chair and this chair is an object. Okay. We if a word is a sign okay, and chair is a word, chair is also a sign. So, if chair is a sign, then chair has to be composed of two parts the signifier and the signified. Okay. Now, the moment I say chair, right, uh, I am not referring to this chair at the moment, moment I say the word chair as a person uh, you know acquainted with the English language, okay, uh, the signifier chair is going to elicit a response in you, a psychological impression or a concept of a chair, right. Because it is arbitrary, we have to learn it, right. Had there been something ontologically, okay, or essentially cherish about a chair, then anyone would know that this is the term we have to use for chair. Okay. So, likewise in, um, in um, the majority of words in all languages, the relationship between a word that is assigned to an object okay, is arbitrary. Now, there are some words which we call onomatopoeic words that is words that uh, resemble the sound. For instance, his, his resembles uh, uh, you know the sound made by a snake. There are now, so source says this well there, uh, there is no denying the fact that there may, there are words in all languages that are onomatopoeic in nature or which resemble or you know there is a one on one correspondence because it resembles the sound. But he says that these are very few, right. So, it does not so few, they are so few in number that uh, after some time and you know this 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 uh, association doesn't really matter because it doesn't apply to other words the repertoire is very small further you know uh, in english we may use the word hiss to indicate the sound made by a snake but the sound made by a snake need not be hiss in other languages so even in onomatopoeic words there is an element of arbitrariness okay so this is one of the fundamental characteristics which also has enormous implications as we understand culture as uh, you know and we understand the, the, the relationship in signs between signs uh, and the signifier and signified in the cultural level as one that is arbitrary. Therefore, the second of course, the second um, point is that meaning is relational, okay, relational in a chain of relations. For instance, a sign is what it is not. This is called uh, meaning by different um, by differentiation, or that meaning is differential. For instance, a cat is uh, a cat not because of its ontology. Okay, a cat. The meaning of cat arises by differentiation with other similar sounding words. Okay, uh, like hat, mat, that and rat. It is because in it is in a system, this is very important. Okay. Remember structuralism is all about systems, it is all about relations, okay. it is all about structures, it is all about relations among different units okay, in a particular structure. So, if you look at this as a structure, the structure of you know, the first sentence is a structure really. Okay. So, cat or the meaning of mat for instance, uh, is derived from its differentiation with, with similar sounding words. Now, in the second sentence we find also uh, from the point of view of not sound, not just sound, if you group them or cluster uh, them in a different way from the point of view of dwelling places. Okay. So, from the point of view of dwelling places, there is nothing ontologically um, 
you know, they uh, ontologically uh, hatish about the word hut that says that you should call a particular dwelling place hut. The assignment of the term hut to a particular uh, you know level of uh, uh, you know dwelling place gets its meaning from its differentiation with all kindred words. Okay. Therefore, meaning is relational in a change. A hut is a hut because it is not a hovel, it is not a shed. Right? A house is a house because it is not a shed or hovel or hut or nor is it a palace. Do you understand? Okay? So, a sign is then what it is not. Right? The meaning is therefore, relational in a chain. So, therefore, see we, we saw that a word is equal to a sign that is a word is a sign. Now, we are going to say when you come to the cultural realm that a sign may also therefore, be any cultural artifact, it may be any cultural object, it may be even a cultural phenomenon or it may be also a cultural practice. We can have an explanatory framework for culture uh, or we can have uh, you know uh, we can have propositions. Okay paradigms in understanding cultural phenomena okay, as units and rules. Look at this slide here please. A sign therefore, is or any cultural artifact, practice, phenomenon, anything in culture is also a sign, because it signifies something right. And it follows, it, it has this meaning in a system of units and rules. Okay. And this is the way, one of the ways in which we can understand and therefore, theorize cultural phenomena. Okay. The meaning of cultural practices, forms, events, okay, all these emanate from a system of difference. Remember relationality, okay, meaning is relation in a change. So, so also you just have to transpose this to the level of the cultural. So, also uh, cultural meaning happens as a matter of relation as a matter of differentiation among with other cultural units and working in a system of units and uh, units and rules. For instance, in this in this we found in the linguistic level that uh, there is a rule here. In the first case the rule is one to do with sound is based on sound. So, you so that you cannot have cat house shared that in one sentence. So, it is these units are following or they are grouped, they are clustered as a, you know laid out here okay, as um, per a particular rule which is based on sound. And in the second instance the rule is based on uh, dwelling places. So, you see this is uh, even in the realm of culture, all cultural practices can be again brought under a structure in which we try and understand those okay, uh, through by uh, by kind of uh, attaching certain rules by which we may understand these. This is the way we theorize um, language, this is the way we theorize cultural practices. Therefore, if you look at this slide, culture is a structured system. Okay. Culture is about signifying practices, any cultural practice will have a meaning. Okay. There, is the, there is a signifier or that is a particular uh, cultural practice that you have which signifies something which gives a meaning, creates a meaning or a concept in us about you know and therefore, it is a matter of signifying practices and it follows you know it is about units and rules, it is in a system of units and rules okay. and these this is something we are coming up with, uh, something we are coming to in the first place. It is also based importantly in the structuralist um, understanding on certain binary op opposites. Now, think about binary opposites uh, in terms of uh, how you understand uh, the word binary in your uh, you know in um, your uh, classes. For instance, in zeros and ones, which is the absence of something and the presence of something. For instance, nature and culture is a binary set. Then man and woman, light and darkness. Okay, black and white. So, these are understood also in another kind of clustering, another kind of uh, you know arranging by rules and that rule is of one of binary opposites. This then we have to say um, is an anti-humanist theory, when you look at meaning 
as humanity from underlying structures, it is an anti humanism. That does not mean it does not mean that it is anti human or that it is anti humanitarian. By anti humanist means, uh, first let us talk about humanism. Humanism is a school of thought, is a philosophy, is an orientation, is a method in which the human occupies center stage, hmm? in which everything is understood in reference to the human being. Okay, the human is the center of reference. Now, structuralism removes the human being as the central point of reference and puts the structure or we may say even the sign as the central point of reference. Right? So, if you look at this slide here, it is anti humanist because it goes outside the individual ego, seeing the individual also as part of a system of structures, seeing his or her cultural practices as to be understood within signifying systems and as within structures and units and rules. Okay. Therefore, things have meaning only in relation to other things in a system of relations and structures and in therefore, this famous statement within structuralism, structuralist understanding or theorizing of culture that is culture is like a language. This is indeed a loaded sentence, we can spend a whole lecture or two only on this, that culture is like, like a language. For us at this elementary level, it simply suffices for us to understand the, you know, the analogy that is drawn from Saussurean linguistics okay, uh, to particularly the sign and its arbitrariness, relationality, differential meaning, okay, uh, units and structures. In that sense, culture is also uh, a language. Okay. Cultural units, forms are also signs that whose meaning comes out in the relation between the signify and signified and very importantly, okay, even politically importantly is the fact that the relation between the sign, the signify and the signified is an arbitrary one, something that we accept only through convention. Therefore, myths as I have pointed out by people like Roland Rola Bath for instance, myths are also second order signs and can also be understood as a system of signifying practices as, as having meaning where meaning emanates uh, through a system of rules through a system uh, of uh, you know of binary opposites for instance and this we can talk about um, later or you know if we have time. Uh, the, the, the political part of it is uh, how is the position here that is important. Remember theory also has to take a position is that uh, you know structuralism shows us because of the arbitrariness of the sign it shows us that and we know that remember that uh, signs are accepted by convention right. The, the deeper question here is how does some thing how does the relationship between a signifier and a signified. Uh, or how does how do binary oppositions where the you know the one or the first term is always a more privileged term like you know man and woman husband and wife okay parent and child uh, then light and dark how is it that they are kind of worked out signified in these ways the point then is that it is ideology okay it is ideology or a way of thinking a way of comprehending the world that naturalizes interpretations and meanings. Meanings do not happen on their own, they are matters of power, ideology okay, of politics that naturalizes meanings, meaning uh, interpretations or meanings and gives us these conceptual maps or, or myths. So, we shall end with a point given by, uh, by one of the famous uh, um, structuralist critics named Jonathan Culler. Okay. Culler says that the combination at the particular moment of a given signifier and signified is a contingent result of the historical process. So, if you understand the historicity and the spatial and temporal situatedness of a meaning connection between the signifier and the signified, then you understand that these are constructs. Okay, these are constructs in time, constructs in space, uh, which have only because of repeated use through its legitimation by power structures have become naturalized and to use a word proper word here conventionalized, okay, but they are not givens. So, like the linguistic sign Jonathan Culler says culture can also be understood as conventional and relational. 
So, let us go on to the discussion. So, name three theoretical approaches in cultural studies. There are many, but only uh, if you talk, if you just have to name three, these are Marxism, structuralism, and post structuralism. Define semiotics. Semiotics may be defined as the science of science. How according to structuralists do we construct meaning? Then we have to say that meaning according to structuralism or structuralists is constructed through the creation and interpretation of science. How do structuralists theorize culture? This, this is the most important question for us. Structuralists say that like language, uh, culture is a similar system. In fact, culture can be read in terms of a language and you know the theory of structuralist linguistics as given to us by Saussure and others and that things or cultural objects, forms, phenomena have meaning only in relation to other things in a system of relations and structures, uh, particularly by differentiation and by binary opposites and which are again remember the first points that we made which are structures of seeing, which are ways of seeing, deep structures of seeing uh, by which we have humankind has been trying to make sense of otherwise chaotic data. These are structures that are imposed. So, in a way it raises the greater philosophical question, then what is reality? And we say that reality is nothing, but the sum total of the structures of the mind that we bring to bear upon the chaotic data that are incoming. Okay. So, this again raises a huge problematic question of whether the reality that we perceive is indeed the whole thing or is it something that is only constructed by us. These are matters really of philosophy and we are not going to go into that. Uh, also in structuralist understanding of culture, we can say that if a word is a sign, then similarly any cultural artifact is a sign and which has its meaning in a system of units and rules, it has its status in a system of units and rules and we understand cultural phenomena as signifying practices. Finally, ideology the more the political position here, then here of course, you can always counter the those who say that structuralism is an apolitical stance, it is, a, is, is an out and out and scientific way. No, by doing this we understand a very important point, because of the arbitrariness, the arbitrariness of the sign, we can therefore, conclude okay, that no sign is is natural. Now, we are not only talking only about the linguistic level, most importantly in the cultural level. Cultural phenomena signify certain things okay? and these significations are not are not a naturalized one, are not uh, naturally given ones, they are naturalized through ideology, okay? through a way of looking at the world about which we will be talking about, I know talking in, uh, in, in another module. right? So, well I hope um, this was not difficult for you nor scary for you. Theory is beautiful, theory is one is a way a rich an uh, enriching way of understanding be it language, be it culture and in um, the next lecture we are going to look at another theory that is Marxism. Thank you.